Anyway, it is a great pleasure to see you uh, all here this evening. And before, uh, for what is the 51st, I believe, William Cone Memorial Lecture um, of, uh, in 2021. And we're absolutely thrilled to have Dr. Ellis uh, Tinios with us here uh, to talk uh, about Japanese illustrated books and prints, of which more in a moment. But before I introduce uh, Dr. Tinius in more detail, I would just like to say a few words about William Cohn, in who's, uh, for whom this lecture series is uh, named. Uh, and William Cohn was, of course, the founder of the Ashmolean Museum's uh, Department of Eastern Art. And this lecture series, in his memory, was, um, was established thanks to the generosity um, of his uh, widow. And so um, a few words about William Cohn. He was, as many of you will know, uh, he was born in Berlin in the late 19th century in 1880, and he, uh, where he studied Oriental art history and archaeology and ethnology at Berlin University. Um, and he then traveled extensively throughout Asia, both studying and, and importantly photographing works of art of all kinds that he found there. And actually the invitation that you will have received for this talk uh, shows the cones at the uh, Byodoin temple outside Kyoto. Um, and of course, William Cohn then went on to publish many books on a wide range of topics uh, from Chinese and Japanese painting to Indian sculpture. Um, his museum career began too in Berlin um, in 1929 when he became curator of the Oriental Department of the Museum for Volkerkunde in Berlin. Uh, but then he left Germany as a refugee in 1938 and eventually settled in Oxford. And it was here in the post war period that he. Uh, completely established the study of um, uh, Eastern art in Oxford, but also recognized the importance of the, at that time, dispersed Asian art collections that were to be found in the Ashmolean Museum, in the Bodleian, and in the Indian Institute as well. Um, and uh, by 1949, he had gathered a, um, many of these collections together to create a museum of Eastern art, which was then housed in the old uh, Indian Institute building in Broad Street. Um, and in part as a result of the foundation of this uh, institution, he helped establish Oxford as a leading international uh, centre for the study of the arts of Asia, um, famous for both its collections and its research. And it was in the year after his death, in 1962, um, that the collection of Asian art was then uh, transferred to the Ashmolean Museum to form what is still the Department of Eastern Art in the museum. Um, so that is William Cohn, but now it, I, it's a huge pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Ellis Tinios to uh, the Ashmolean and uh, to give this year's um, Cohn lecture. As many of you will know, uh, Dr. Tinios uh, was born in the USA and trained in both America and uh, uh, Britain in the UK, uh, studying at Harvard and Leeds and Michigan before establishing himself as a scholar, um, as a Marshall Scholar and then as lecturer and senior lecturer in East uh, Asian history in the School of History at Leeds, where he um, worked from 1978 to 2002 and during that time his interest shifted from the historians of ancient China to the print culture in early modern Japan and since his early retirement in 2002 he has been participated in and been engaged in a huge variety of Japan related research projects with colleagues at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, uh, colleagues in Cambridge, the British Museum, uh, the Art Research Centre in Ritsumeikan at the uni uh, University in Kyoto, uh, where he has also been a visiting researcher uh, at the Art Research Centre there. Um, he's taught um, on numerous courses 
on the book in Japan at Harvard and the Freer Sackler Gallery under the auspices of the Rare Book School as well at the University of Virginia. And among his many publications, um, Understanding Japanese Woodblock, Woodblock Printed Illustrated Books um, and the much reprinted Japanese prints uh, Ukiyo-e in Edo uh, published by the British Museum. And he's also, of course, a regular contributor to print quarterly. Um, he's also well known by us here at the Ashmolean, uh, where he's uh, given talks over many years, and it is a huge pleasure to welcome him back to uh, the Ashmolean, albeit virtually uh, this evening, uh, to give um, a talk on the story of a neglected book, Okasai's Illustrated Tang Poetry of 1880. So, um, Ellis, over to you. Yes, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be uh, here in, to give uh, the Cone Lecture. Uh, and um, uh, it's better that we're doing it virtually than not at all. Uh, so let's go. <laughs> My lecture this evening centers upon Hoksai, the book illustrator. Hoksai is probably best known to you for his color woodblock prints, in particular the Great Wave. However, books were central to the formation of his reputation in his lifetime. After his death in 1849, his books remained popular in Japan, and from the late 1850s, they were in the vanguard of his recognition and appreciation outside of Japan. They attracted notice in Europe and North America well before his color woodblock prints or paintings. From the 1810s, the name Hokusai was the single hottest property in art book publishing in Japan. Now to explain, art books in this context refer to drawing manuals and to picture books without significant texts or didactic intent. In addition to being a prolific creator of art books, Hoksai was also in demand as an illustrator of fiction, school textbooks, and poetry anthologies. Judged by any standard, his achievements in book format were remarkable. No other Japanese artist produced as rich and varied a corpus of images for reproduction in book form. Few other Japanese artists' books remained in print for as long as his. No other artists' books were disseminated as wise, widely as Hokusai's. <clears throat> now, I'd like to stress that the images you will see this evening are not reproductive prints. They are parts of original works of art issued in multiples. They were created expressly for duplication in book format, in books that were printed from cut wood blocks. Now, an anthology of Chinese poetry illustrated by Hoksai lies at the heart of my lecture today. I first stumbled upon this book in Leiden in December 2018. Its title, Ehon Toshisen Gogun Zeku. Uh, this title may be translated as the Toshisen Five Character Quatrains Illustrated. Uh, I'll explain the meaning of Toshisen in a moment. But henceforth, in my lecture tonight, I will simply refer to this book as Ehon Toshisen. I recognized Toshisen as a book by Hoksai, but not one that I knew. I consulted with my colleague, Henri Kerlin author of the massive catalogue of pre-Meiji Japanese books and maps in public collections in the Netherlands. It was unknown to him as well. I brought it to the attention of my late colleague and friend Roger Keyes, compiler of the catalogue raisonné of Hoksai's prints and a great connoisseur of Hoksai's art. Roger was struck by the beauty of the book, the fineness of its execution, but it was also unknown to him. I consulted Jack Hillier's exhaustive The Art of Hoksai in Book Illustration, the book was not known to Hillier when he concluded his study in 1980. After further research, I tracked down three passing references to the book in bibliographies. In two of those, it was completed with another similarly titled edition of Tang Dynasty Poetry, illustrated by Hoksai. Finally, I found an entry on Ehon Toshisen in Hoksai and his school, Paintings, Drawings, and Illustrated Books, uh, a, a catalog. And here's the spread that was reproduced in that catalog, which was published in conjunction with an exhibition held in Harlem in 1982. The copy of Ehon Toshisen included in that exhibition 
which came from an unidentified private collection, was incomplete. The title page and the colophon with their vital publishing information had been removed. They'd been removed intentionally. Thus, Matty Forer, the editor of the catalogue, could only offer a tentative, incomplete description of the book. The appearance of Ehon Toshisen in that obscure catalogue did not lead to its attracting wider notice. Now, Ehon Toshisen was first offered for sale in January 1880 by the leading Tokyo publisher, Suzambo. This firm had been in business from the late 17th century and had many distinguished books to its credit. Shuzanbo commissioned Ehon Toshisen from Hokusai in around 1836. Hokusai delivered the block ready drawings to the publisher at that time. However, 44 years were to pass before those drawings were destroyed in the process of cutting the blocks from which the book was printed. The posthumous publication fully realized the artist's intention. Yet, as we have seen, for all of its qualities, it attracted scant notice from scholars, curators, and collectors. Its neglect was due in part to its extreme rarity and also to the ease with which it might have been misidentified, mistaken for another Hokusai book. At present, I have located five copies of Ehon Toshisen in Japanese libraries, just three copies in libraries in Europe and North America, they're in Chicago, Brussels, and Genoa, and three further copies in private European collections. This is very slim pickings for a substantial product of Hokusai's maturity. Before turning to Ehon Toshisen, I would like to contextualize its publication by providing a brief overview of the role of Chinese culture in early modern Japan. The Chinese classics, Chinese poetry, and Chinese literature were central to the cultural life of educated Japanese in the Edo period. That's from 1605 to 1868. Chinese was the language employed by those engaged in the study and practice of medicine, philosophy, and statecraft. It was also the language of practitioners of high culture, which encompassed the writing of history, literary criticism, and also the emergent field of art history. Additionally, the corpus of uh, Japanese language popular fiction was enriched with translations of Chinese works that ranged from collections of short stories through historical romances to lengthy picaresque novels. Written Japanese, then and now, combines Chinese characters, kanji, which function as ideographs with syllabic signs, kana. To assure the widest market for their books, publishers made it standard practice to use glosses to, to indicate the pronunciation and therefore the meaning of Chinese characters employed in writing Japanese language texts. These glosses, known as furigana, literally attached syllabics, were printed in smaller size syllabic uh, kana to the right of vertical columns of text, as you can see in the example here, where the kanji, the Chinese characters, are printed in black. I've transcribed this first line of text, and the kana, the syllabics, are white. And then in the text itself, I've highlighted in green the furigana, which tell us how to pronounce the characters to their left. The use of wood blocks for all commercial publishing in the Yeddo period facilitated the widespread use of these glosses. I regard the need to provide these glosses as the key factor, if not the decisive factor, in the abandonment of movable type in favor of cut wood blocks by the publishing industry in Japan by the 1640s. But that's a story for another day. <clears throat> now, education in the Edo period commenced with learning the syllabaries and a few common Chinese characters. There was an extensive body of popular literature that was accessible to those with just that basic level of literacy. Pupils advanced to a higher level of literacy through the mastery of Chinese characters which was achieved by memorizing Chinese texts, such as the thousand character classic. That is a text written of 1000 characters. No character is repeated in it. So you get a basic character vocabulary by mastering it. And then also the classic of filial piety. Immersion in such Confucian texts 
contributed to the pupil's assimilation of the concepts of filiality and loyalty on which the social and political order established by the Tokugawa shoguns rested. The steady demand for these school texts provided publishers with an assured revenue stream. They issued them in numerous editions to meet the varied requirements of schools and individuals. Suzanbo, the publishing house I've already mentioned, for example, had an astonishing 27 editions of the classic of filial piety in print in the middle decades of the 19th century. While there was a vigorous tradition of Japanese language poetry, many educated Japanese in the Edo period also appreciated Chinese poetry and even composed it themselves, often with credible results. There was an appetite, therefore, for Japanese editions of anthologies of Chinese poems and for manuals on the rules governing the composition of Chinese poetry. It was a do-it-yourself Chinese poetry book, the books that, that, that were also much in demand. The most popular of the anthologies was Toshisen, which translates as an anthology of uh, Tang Dynasty poems. Um, so Toshisen. This was compiled in the Ming Dynasty by um, Li Pang Lung. He arranged 465 poems by 128 Tang Dynasty poets into seven sections. They were grouped on the basis of their form. This anthology was known in Japan from the first half of the 17th century. By the mid 19th century, our friend the publisher Suzanbo had 22 distinct editions of Toshisen in print. These editions are distinguished by the presence or the absence of interlinear translations or of annotations or commentaries or illustrations. They're also differentiated by the calligraphic style in which the poems are presented. One of these Suzanbo editions, the richly illustrated and annotated Toshisen Ehon, which we see here, and illustrated Toshisen, was published in seven parts, each composed of five volumes between 1788 and 1836, over nearly 50 years. The entire enterprise ran to over 1,100 pages. Hokusai provided the illustrations for the 10 volumes making up parts six and seven, which were published in 1833 and 1836 respectively. So we have Toshisen, the anthology brought in from China. We have this stupendous Toshisen Ehon edition, 35 volumes published over 50 years. And then finally, we have the book that's the subject of my talk today, Ehon Toshisen Gogunzeko, the Toshisen five character quatrains illustrated. And this was issued in two volumes by Suzanbo in 1880. So please try to keep those three titles in mind. You may be wondering about the delay between Hokusai's completion of the block ready drawings for Ehon Toshisen in the mid 1830s and Suzanbo's eventual publication of the book in 1880. Delays in the publication, in publication were not uncommon. There were delays of 10 to 15 years between the delivery of the block ready drawings and the publication of a number of important Hokusai books. In fact, we have complete sets of block ready drawings prepared by Hokusai for fine books that never made it into print. The discovery of these sets of block ready drawings of the past 15 years represents one of the most exciting new developments in Hokusai studies. Just last summer, for example, the British Museum acquired 103 block ready drawings for a book titled Bambutsu Ehon Dai Senzu the great picture book of everything, which Hokusai completed in 1829 and for which he received payment from the commissioning publisher. Now the editor in charge when Hokusai provided illustrations for the last two parts of the Toshisen Ehon project was the noted scholar and author Takai Ranzan. While working on Toshisen Ehon, uh, that is the massive anthology, Ranzan and Hokusai were also commissioned by Suzanbo to collaborate on two school texts, an illustrated classic of loyalty and an illustrated classic of filial piety. 
One of the publisher's advertisements for the latter assured parents that Hoxnay's illustrations would keep their children from getting bored while studying the text. But what we can see here is that Hoxai uh, and uh, Takai Ranzan were a good team. They worked well together. They worked together on um, the Toshisen Ehon part six and part seven. They worked together on the two school class uh, books and they were also working together on a novel based on uh, uh, an imported Chinese work. Um, because, so these were, these were the, the, the poetry albums were far from Hoxnay's first engagement with Chinese texts. His compelling vision of China first attracted wide notice with the publication in 1805 of um, uh, the opening volumes of a translation and adaptation of the picaresque vernacular Chinese novel, Tales from the Water Margin. In such novels, the running text was interrupted every so many pages by a double page illustration. And here we have three from Tales of the Water Margin. Um, Hoxai preferred uh, the broad uh, canvas provided uh, by these, this format of book because it allowed him to present vibrant, complex scenes, which he enriched with incidental details of Chinese customs, architecture, dress, and landscape. Hoxai, like all of his contemporaries in Japan, had no direct experience of China. He could only access the country through imported paintings, painting manuals, copy books, illustrated books, and artifacts. He assimilated these disparate sources to present what we might call a gripping virtual China. Now, Hoxai's Chinese books of the 1830s, the two textbooks, the poetry anthologies, formed just part of his prolific output in that decade. It was in those years that he created the greatest of all his books, 100 Views of Fuji's Peak, as well as two further volumes of the popular Hoxai manga series, three powerful warrior books, and a book devoted to carpentry. Now, the Ashmolean possesses a complete set of Hoxai's manga and a splendid first edition of the 100 Views of Fuji's Peak. In the, going back now to the 1830s, in the first half of the 1830s, Hoxai was also, uh, also produced his finest print series, foremost of which was 36 views of Fuji's Peak. The creativity and productivity of the septuagenarian artist was astonishing and an example to us all. Now, Suzanne Bo, pleased by the reception of Hoxai's illustrations for the Toshisen Ehon volumes, commissioned him to illustrate the 74 poems in the Toshisen anthology that were in the Gogunzeku five character quatrain format for publication as a standalone work. Suzanbo had already published those 74 quatrains as part one of the massive Toshisen Ehon uh, project half a century earlier in 1788. And he kept it in print. He kept those, those first uh, five volumes that make up part one in print over those uh, decades. However, the illustrations in that edition were by Tachibana Sekiho, an artist of modest accomplishments. He was hoping for something better from Hoxai. Hoxai completed his block ready drawings for this new commission and handed them over to Zanbo in around 1836. However, the publisher was obliged to put the project on hold. The economic and political crisis that convulsed Japan in the late 1830s may have been a contributing factor. The exact circumstances leading to Suzanbo's post moment of this and other projects are not known. The publisher did, however, preserve Hoxai's block ready drawings as a valuable asset. So, 44 years passed before Suzanne Bo finally offered Hoxai's Eon Toshisen for sale. The colophon reveals that copyright was granted on the 17th of December, 1879, and the book was published on 30th of January, 1880. The inside back cover carries a list of 12 booksellers in Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka, who were enlisted to act as distributors for this distinguished book. In its published form, two volumes, 
with 26 poems in the first and 25 poems in the second volume, Ehon Toshisen falls short of the total of 74 five character quatrains in the Toshisen anthology. The 23 missing quatrains make up the final third of that section. It appears that the block ready drawings for those 23 quatrains were lost or damaged in the interval between their completion by Hoxai in the mid 1830s and the cutting of the printing blocks in 1879. These things happen. The loss of those designs may explain the absence of a preface in the book. In preparing such a preface, the publisher would have had to address the history of the book and explain the substantial lacuna. Now, the only near contemporary uh, mention of Ehon Toshisen appears in the 95 page Suzanbo Hatsuda Shomoku, Suzanbo's catalog of published books. This catalog was issued by the firm in 1891, 11 years after the publication of Ehon Toshisen. Ehon Toshisen is listed twice in it. In each instance, it's accompanied by a note. So Ehon Toshisen first appears in the poetry, literature, and song section, where it is described as follows. Katsushika Hokusai's model book, Toshisen Ehon Gogun Zeko, with figured satin covers complete in two volumes, net price, one yen, 80 sen. This book was published from an authentic manuscript of images, permeated with the creative spirit of Master Katsushika Hokusai's last years. That means it is full of human figures, birds and beasts, all as if actually alive. If you have a passionate desire to study the arts, please purchase a copy of this book and you'll know just how extraordinary it is. I always enjoy reading these uh, blurbs that the, the, that the publishers cre created for their works. Um, and then um, in the, uh, the, a lengthier note uh, accompanies the book in its second appearance, which is in the painting section of the catalog. The latter reads, Katsushika Hokusai's model book, a beautiful book print, printed on Masamegami paper with figured satin covers complete in two volumes, net price two yen. This book of the complete Toshisen five character quatrains was published from an authentic manuscript of images permeated with the creative spirit of Master Katsushika Hokusai's later years. This means it's full of human figures, birds and beasts, all as if actually alive. It then goes on, Already several thousand copies have been ordered and exported for sale abroad. Anyone with a passionate desire to study art or craftsmen who sculpt and engraves or, or a craftsman who sculpts or engraves objects or a merchant who wants to export goods to make a great profit, please purchase a copy of this book and you will know how extraordinary it is. Now, both of these notes stress that the block ready drawings employed in the production of Ehon Toshisen were genuine and imbued with Hokusai's creative spirit. They are described as products of Hokusai's later years, in other words, the 1830s when the artist was in his 70s, and at the peak of his creativity and productivity. This assurance was needed because a number of Erzat's Hokusai books had long been in circulation. The note concludes by declaring that Ehon Toshisen is a remarkable publication. That description is borne out by the minuteness and precision of the block cutting and the care taken in printing from the resultant wood blocks in order to realize the artist's intentions three decades after his death. However, neither note admits that the book is in fact a glorious fragment. The second note brazenly claims that it offers the reader the complete five character quatrain section of Toshisen. Retailing at 1 yen 80 sen, Ehon Toshi Singo Gunzeko is the most expensive of the 60 books listed in the poetry, literature, and song section of the catalog. In the painting section, the deluxe edition is described, which sells for 2 yen. To put these prices in perspective, at the time of the book's publication, the average monthly salary was 18 yen. The deluxe 2 yen edition is identified as being printed on Masa Megami paper, a thicker and costlier grade of paper than was usually encountered in woodblock printed books of the period. Larger sheets of paper were also used. Here we have on the left the deluxe edition and on the right the standard edition. 
Um, closed the deluxe edition measures uh, 240 by 165 millimeters, while the standard edition me measures 225 by 145 millimeters. Now, such variations in paper quality and size are not unusual. Throughout the Edo period and into the ensuing Meiji period, quality books were available printed on various grades of paper and in various sizes. The covers of the costlier edition of Ehon Toshisen are embossed with cherry blossoms, and the title slip pasted on the front cover of each volume is printed on brocade silk rather than paper, a rare luxury. And the inside front cover of the first volume is uh, decorated with flakes of gold leaf. Both of the notes uh, from the catalogue identify Ehon Toshisen as a model book. And the second reveals that the publisher had a wider audience in mind than one composed solely of aspiring artists. The book was also recommended, <clears throat> as you'll recall, to craftsmen as a source of motifs to apply to their handicrafts. And additionally, exporters are assured of a profit if they purchase copies for sale abroad. <clears throat> Excuse me. The statement in the second note, that several thousand copies of the book had already been exported to foreign countries, appears to be an exaggeration. As I have already noted, so far I've only been able to track down six copies of Ehon Toshisen outside of Japan, and one of those I know left the country in 2019. Now, <clears throat> there was a buoyant market in Japan and abroad for Hokusai's art books in the last half of the 19th century. <clears throat> His most popular titles, such as 100 Views of Fuji's Peak, in the 15 volumes of the Hokusai manga series, were kept in print by a succession of publishers into the 20th century and beyond, albeit in impressions of ever decreasing quality. As recently as 2017, Unsodo, a Kyoto publishing house, printed 150 copies of the Hokusai manga from refreshed woodblocks, in other words, recut. However, Hokusai's Chinese books, with their substantial textual components, and exotic visual content did not enjoy the same ongoing appeal. None of them have so far been identified in Meiji era printings. So why did Suzanbo decide to go against this trend and publish a Chinese book like Ehon Toshisen in 1880? It must have seemed worth the risk since unlike Hokusai's other Chinese books, in Ehon Toshisen, the illustrations do not compete for space with translations of the Chinese text into Japan, Japanese or with extensive Japanese language commentaries. Hokusai incorporated a rectangular cartouche into each of his designs to accompany uh, the poem he was illustrating, just the poem. There were no translations in the body of the book, no commentaries. From its inception, Ehon Toshisen was always about Hokusai's masterful visualization of the poetry. However, most Japanese purchasers of the book would have required translations, and the publisher provided those tucked back into the last two pages of each volume. And you here see the two volumes open, and you have the first uh, page of the translations in each. So you get the Chinese text and then the, an interlinear uh, translation with it. Now, in 1879, Suzanbo commissioned the cal calligrapher <coughs> Takada Soichiro to inscribe the quatrains in the empty cartouches in Hokusai's block ready drawings. He varied the style in which he wrote the quatrains from page to page in response to Hokusai's <coughs> illustrations, thus avoiding monotony in the appearance of the texts. The publisher then engaged Otsuka Tetsugoro, one of the leading block cutters of the day, to cut the printing blocks. Tetsugoro rose to the challenge presented by Hokusai's detailed designs. The finished product was a fine book offered for sale for a substantial sum. Hokusai's illustrations for Ehon Toshisen provide a further example of the artist's imaginative engagement with China and demonstrate once again his inexhaustible creativity. The images he created for this book display great variety in content and in scale from close-up portraits to flower and bird studies to vast landscapes in which human figures are reduced to little more than distant specks. The images are rich in telling details without being cluttered. 
the impact of these line only book illustrations often matches the impact of these single sheet color wood block prints of the same period. I would like to pause here to present 14 illustrations from the book without comment. I will then discuss the visual paratext hooks I created for this book. And finally, I will look in detail at Hoxai's response to four of the poems. So let us just begin now the survey. We're almost there. And then finally, this startling uh, portrait, idealized portrait. Uh, it's the poet Li Bai, and the poem reads, masses of white hair, because of my sorrows, because my sorrows are equally numerous. I know not whence came this autumn frost in the bright mirror. <clears throat> but as I say, um, uh, shortly, I will look at four of the poems in detail. Now, the illustrated poems in Ehon Toshisen are framed by visual paratexts that are rich in Chinese literati associations. The title sheet on the inside front cover, that's on the right, of the first volume sets the scholarly tone of the book. Note that it is also decorated with gold leaf. Um, <clears throat> it presents the basic bibliographic data regarding the book, uh, the name of the artist uh, on the ink stick, uh, sorry, uh, to the right of the brush over here, the name of the artist. We have the title of the book uh, uh, on the inkstone, and then here we have the name of the publisher. Uh, now, this is a writing box, we're viewing it from above, and it contains three of the four treasures of the scholar's study, that is brushes, ink stick, and inkstone. And then we also have a water dropper here. Um, the fourth treasure, Paper is absent from this illustration, but its presence is implied after all the paper itself of the book. Now, fine personal seals were also treasures uh, of the scholar's study. Thus, the design of the title page for the first volume on the left is composed of, a, of an intaglio seal and its impression. So this is the seal here, seen from the side with loops uh, that you would hold, hold it, uh, you'd hold it from those loops. And down below, we have the impression of the seal. Uh, which reveals to us that it's been inscribed, incised, with the title of the book in the earliest of the Chinese scripts in seal script. The title page of the second volume here um, commemorates Feng Dao, uh, who is sometimes referred to, uh, he was active between, uh, he lived between 1881 and uh, eight. 81, excuse me, and uh, 954. And he's sometimes referred to anachronistically and Eurocentrically as China's Gutenberg for his contributions in the development of printing in China. 
He is presented seated on a cushion before a low table on which there are rolls of paper, a stubby brush for inking printing blocks, a barren to execute the printing, and a mallet possibly used to soften the paper. On the floor to his right is a large instone with the brush resting on it. Uh, Feng Dao looks up at the full title of the book, uh, uh, presented as a bold white on black text in scribe script. The present presentation of the title here resembles the rubbing of a stone inscription. Now Feng Dao's achievement is celebrated because printing assured the preservation of the vast corpus of Tang Dynasty poetry. And when the technology was transferred to Japan, it made the poems available at affordable prices uh, to Japanese devotees of Chinese culture. Now the first uh, full opening of each volume pairs single page illustrations treating themes dear to the Dorati. They may be regarded as pictorial preambles to each volume. In the first volume here, Hokusai depicts on the right, a poet in the act of setting a poem down on a sheet of paper, opposite an artist who is putting finishing touches on a painting. And these images illustrate the couplet, poetry is a painting in sound, painting is a soundless poem. This couplet calls to mind Leonardo da Vinci's observation, painting is poetry that is seen and not heard, and poetry is painting that is heard but not seen. And the following pages repeatedly demonstrate Hokusai's appetite, ap aptitude for turning poems into pictures. His illustrations complement and enhance our appreciation of the poems. The pictorial preamble to the second volume is more erudite. Hokusai pairs illustrations that commemorate on the right the inventor of poetry itself, and the left the creator of the five character quatrain anthologized in this book. So the first text informs us that Shun, the last of China's legendary five emperors, composed the world's first poem. The second text names Li Ling of the Han Dynasty, who was active in the first century BC as the inventor of the four five character quatrain. And then single page portraits set within circular frames appear as tailpieces at the end of each volume. Volume one concludes with a portrait of Meng Tian, the purported inventor of writing brushes, seating in a, seated at a table, preparing writing brushes. And volume two concludes with a portrait of Xue Ji, the purported inventor of ink sticks. He had served as chancellor during the Tang Dynasty and is regarded as one of China's four great calligraphers. He's there at his desk preparing ink sticks. As though these two framing images were not enough, Hoxai concluded the second volume with two images in which he celebrates the manufacture of black ink or the production of the soot that's needed to make black ink. Actually, The text on the first illustration reads, that's on the right, Li Xia observing the heat of the flame obtained lamp black. Li Xia is depicted brushing soot out of a metal lid that had been suspended above a burning wick. Behind him are three shelves laden with shallow bowls filled with oil. The wick burns in each. A metal, lid is a metal lid is suspended above each blow, bowl to collect soot from the flaming wick. On the left, the text records that Li Zhao and his son Ting Wei, who were active in the early 10th century, employed the soot obtained from burning pine and bamboo to make ink. Hoxai depicts the two men working a large collection chamber in which they accumulate the soot. These images reflect Hoxai's long-standing interest in depicting industrial processes, mechanisms, and machines in his books. Now, brushes and ink were memorialized in Ehon Toshisen because they were needed for the composition, recording, and transmission of poetry. They were also essential for two other scholarly pursuits, painting and calligraphy. I've mused on what Hoxai might have uh, commemorated in the lost third volume. I suspected it might have been the production of paper, and my suspicion um, was confirmed with this sheet from the British Museum's recently acquired set of Hoxai block ready drawings. In it, we see Feng Dao, China's Gutenberg, in the center here, cutting a printing block. Uh, Li Zhao is on the left. Again, he, we see him, he's making uh, ink sticks. And then in the front center, we have Sai Pian of the latter Han Dynasty. Uh, he's missing in Ehun Toshisen, but we see him here, he's making paper. 
he is the figure missing from Ehun Toshisen. <clears throat> you may recall that uh, Suzanbo had launched the massive 35 volume illustrated and annotated edition of uh, the complete Toshisen anthology in 1788. Part one of that edition presents the 74 uh, five character quatrains and Tachibana Sekiho, the illustrator, referenced important Chinese illustrated books in his designs. However, his response to those Chinese models was stiff and naively stylized, far from Hokusai's robust treatment of his Chinese sources. Nonetheless, I found that Hokusai often used Sekiho's compositions as starting points for his own designs. I conclude my lecture this evening with an examination of Hokusai's response to four of the quatrains in light of Sekiho's treatment of them. Let us begin with Song of Youth by the poet Sui Guofu. Having lost my coral riding crop, my arrogant horse refuses to go. They snap the switch from a willow tree. On a spring day, the roadside has its delights. The poet tells of a youth losing a precious coral riding crop on a visit to a brothel and how when his horse balked at his commands, he broke a branch off a willow tree to serve as a replacement. The final line of the quatrain notes the delights of the roadside on a spring day, a euphemism for visiting brothels. In Sekiho's visualization of the poem, four women of the brothel watch the youth. He, mounted on his horse with a broken off willow branch in his raised hand, looks back at them. All, fig all five figures are puppet-like. The horse would not look out of place on the carousel. The buildings and trees could be from a willow pattern plate. Hoxai's focus, in contrast, is on the frustration of the youth. The figure of the youth is dynamic. He stretches up, grabs the branch of the willow tree with his left hand, and he's extending his right hand to stamp off the switch. His mount stands four square with lowered head and twitching tail. Further animation is added to the scene uh, with the banner tossing in the breeze. Minute figures can just be seen on the balcony of this building here. If we look at that detail, that is the brothel. The tiny figures echo Sekiho's been used observers, but Hokusai's concern is with the youth's frustration with his recalcitrant horse. Now let's move on to a poem by Qian Qi. So there we can compare the two images. So very close, this is the uh, second poem. So very close, but I fear the wind and rain will prevent me from ascending Lushan. I do doubt if in those misty caves, there are still six dynasty monks. The voice is that of a traveler walking into driving rain as he journeys on foot along the Yangtze. He regrets that in such conditions, he will not be able to ascend Mount Lushan, one of China's sacred mountains. But then he doubts if the legendary monks of the sixth dynasty are still to be found in their caves. Perhaps he's expressing sour grapes for not being able to make the ascent. Now, Sekiho's highly stylized rendition of rain wind, clouds, mountains, and trees do not form a coherent whole. His travelers buried deep in their umbrellas appear to be tiptoeing along against three perfunctory diagonal bands of rain. Hoxai takes this image as his starting point, but there we are. In Hoxai's illustration, the viewer's attention is immediately arrested by the force of the elements conveyed <clears throat> uh, by the um, sharp parallel diagonal lines that run across the entire double page spread. The foreground and distant landscape alike are viewed through this curtain of rain. The two travelers who dominate the composition um, uh, stride steadily and purposefully away from the viewer. The head of a third figure has just come into view. He's ascending the embankment that the others are about to descend. Only his face and an arm holding on to his hat appear. His eyes are shut tight as he struggles up the steep slope. In both of these examples, 
Oksai outstripped his predecessor's best efforts to produce powerful visual commentaries on the poems, even as he took Sekiho's designs as his starting point. Now let's turn to another poem by Li Bai. The birds fly off into the Empyrean. A solitary cloud idly passes by. Exchanging glances, we two aren't bored, just Mount Jing Ting and me. Here Li Bai celebrates losing oneself in the majesty of nature. Formerly, Sekiho and Hoksai's treatments are mere images of one another. The poet is seated beneath a tree looking up towards a mountain peak. Sekiho takes care to render each detail in the poem. Hoksai's concern is with the poet lost in the majesty of the mountain, leaving it to the viewer to supply the birds and the passing cloud. The execution of the block from which this image was printed is a tour de force of the block cutter's art. In his visualization of Tongan Misty poems, Hoksai goes beyond picturing settings and protagonists to convey the time of day and the force of the elements, bright sunlight at midday, a snowy dawn, frost in the middle of the night, driving rain and wind are all made real. He achieves all of this through lying alone without shading or tints. Color is supplied by the words of the poem. Consider, for example, his treatment of a, another poem by Du Fu, Against the blue of the river, the birds so intensely white. Against the green of the hills, the flowers about to ignite. This spring is no sooner seen than gone, which will be the year of my homecoming. The scholar official who speaks uh, these lines is depicted paused on a distant bridge, attended by a boy servant to take in the scene. In a startling play with space and perception, Hoksai rotates what they are seeing a full 180 degrees and brings it into the near foreground to face us. The expanse of empty space surrounding the diminutive observers, the large fully open blossoms set against a minimal amount of black uh, uh, dark foliage and the three white Chinese geese moving gracefully against the fine pattern of shimmering ripples they are creating on the surface of the water together convey the impression of a scene seen in bright midday light. How different this is from Sekiho's cluttered rendering of this poem. Yet even here, Sekiho provided Hoksai with a starting point for his design, the two figures on the bridge, pausing on the bridge to take in the scene. Neither the bridge nor the Bore attendant are mentioned in the poem. Hoksai borrowed both from Sekiho. However, he did not follow Sekiho's lead in setting the scene in a complex landscape. Hoksai dispensed entirely with hills, banks, paths, streams, reeds, and trees. Nor did, did he depict the unidentified birds in the poem as egrets. He chose to present them as white Chinese geese. <clears throat> the animation with which they are depicted brings to mind a painting of ducks Hoksai created 10 years later when he was 88, which is now in the British Museum. And here is a detail from that magnificent painting. <clears throat> the calligrapher chose seal script of the poem, the delicacy and openness of which balances perfectly with Hoksai's designs. Hoksai's extraordinary powers of composition and unerring sense of line and his ability to offer fresh and exciting visualizations of his source text as seen in uh, this example are evident throughout Ehon Toshisan. In conclusion, stumbling upon Ehon Toshisen just over two years ago, confirming Hoksai's authorship of it, tracing its complex publishing history, finding a copy of Suzanne Bo's 1891 catalog containing the two blurbs that extol the book's virtues and give us its price, identifying and differentiating the standard and deluxe editions, translating the poems and discovering the links to Sekiho's renderings of the same group of poems have all been stages in a richly rewarding journey of discovery for me. The fruits of this journey have been this COVID delayed Cone Lecture and two articles published last year in Print Quarterly and in Art Research, a journal published by the Art Research Center at Lisa University. Through this lecture, and the articles I've sought to illuminate this unjustly neglected work 
seeking to confirm its place in the corpus of Hoxai's books. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ellis, for uh, just a wonderful exploration of uh, this this discovery and this treasure. So I know we don't have COVID to thank for very much, uh, but we do at least for this work. So um, and and for your sharing of it with us. So thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Tinio kindly said that he would uh, answer questions should there be any, and. Uh, although there, uh, there's many comments arriving in the chat and I am going to try and filter the questions out of them. There was one that uh, arrived earlier, which um, I might paraphrase and may actually slightly change the um, uh, sense of in doing so. But there was a question about what was particularly admired about Hoxai as a printmaker. And I suppose just thinking about the 1880s, where there was a particular um, the sort of impetus to publish this book and to make it available, uh, was driven by particular enthusiasm for Hoxai at that moment, and if that was based on anything in particular. The, the enthusiasm for Hoxai uh, was extraordinary. Uh, he was extremely popular in Japan, uh, certainly from the 1810s onward. Um, and uh, then uh, when his books reached Europe, um, artists and collectors responded enthusiastically uh, to them. I think part of it is there's, a, there's tremendous humanity in, in what uh, Hoxai produced, uh, his, his viewing, his depiction of, of, of people, but also he had this encyclopedic interest. There was nothing that was not uh, worthy of his attention and uh, his including it in his, his books. So the manga, for example, uh, range from, um, um, uh, you know, looms, uh, buckets, uh, to, 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 to goddesses uh, and, and everything in between. Um, his, uh, um, his Chinese books uh, possess this richness of detail uh, that is really remarkable. It, it, it draws you in. Um, the uh, the hundred views of Fuji presents image after image of of this pivots around Fuji's peak uh, that shows this extraordinary inventiveness. So he had so much to offer, uh, I think, uh, both to the Japanese and to us in in Europe and North America, um, as we uh, were confronted with these books. And elsewhere, I, I've worked on this. Uh, the he there were a number of publishers who uh, kept his books in print. And because they were produced in such large numbers, this also assisted in establishing and his reputation globally. And he does have a global reputation. Um, and so, and there are a number of questions spe uh, specifically about the book, which, again, maybe I'll uh, group them together um, yes. because some I think are swiftly answered, but others may uh, lead further on. Um, an interesting question, which I hadn't considered listening to the lecture, is why why no colour? Does that does that is that an is that an interesting question? Why no colour? The question uh, about whether he uh, Hokusai was responsible for the calligraphy as well as the images, and then also a question given the price of the book, which you talked about, if there was you know uh, what the market for this book might have been if we know anything about yeah, the specific yeah. market I, I think within Japan I, I mean you've spoken a bit about the international market but within yeah. within Japan yeah. okay so first of all why no color um, uh, even though uh, color printing had been mastered in Japan uh, for, 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 for a very long time uh, it was very expensive very expensive and there was uh, Oksai in the 17 90s in the 1810, first decade of the 19th century, produced some extraordinary uh, large format multi-volume poetry anthologies that had color illustrations in them. They, they were, everything was in color. Uh, but some of those were then reissued in line only because there was a limit to the number of full color printed books that you could sell. You often found this, not only his books, but other art, Uta, Uta Amado's books as well, for example, you might find a, a full color edition and then a line only edition. Um, 
but uh, that's books that, that had color in them that was removed, but also you had books that never had color in them. And uh, one of the astonishing things is to see how much Japanese artists could do simply with line and areas of black. Uh, and uh, then you have a kind of compromise between the two, which is what you find in the Hokusai manga, for example, where there are two further blocks that print in pink and gray. I'm sorry, I don't have an example to put on the screen right now. Uh, and uh, those, uh, that line with pink and gray was used very effectively uh, by artists in many, many books. But there's nothing exceptional about a book being published without color. And I always feel that in these Tang poetry anthologies, the poems tell you what the colors are as you look at his, his illustrations. Uh, calligraphy, um, no, as I said in this, uh, uh, the calligraphy was done by a, uh, a, a named calligrapher. And uh, this was usually the case that uh, you would have a, a calligrapher invited to inscribe a particularly important text in a book. Uh, as to the market, well, this was going to be a, the, the salary of the eight, 18 yen a month, that was the average salary. So there were obviously people who had disposable income uh, who would be buying this book. But it's also clear that Suzanbo had an eye on the foreign market. But my impression is that this book did not sell well. There's so few copies of it abroad, it's quite startling. And uh, for him to say thousands were exported, I don't believe that was the case. Uh, there's no evidence of a second printing of the book either. Uh, all of the copies that I've been able to see have been pristine. So it indicates very early that the blocks were not used until when you were getting poor impressions. Hey, there was a question about the, the luxury edition as against the um, standard edition, for want of a better word. Uh, and in the images you showed, there seemed to be um, a difference in the margins as well. Like the question uh, is, was the same block used for both? I, presume it was but um it, it, yes it, it was the same block used for both and because you're using larger paper obviously you end up getting much larger margins but it's the same block um uh could you please show again the university where the illustrations came from or is there anywhere where it is possible to see more so i yes are is the book available or findable online? To, um... Available through the Ritsumekan University Early Japanese Book Portal Database. Um, uh, let me see, if you try going to Art Research Center at Ritsumekan University and go to the English uh, side uh, and look for the Early Japanese Book Portal Database, it should take you uh, to the search page and if you put Ehon Toshisen, just take it off the title of this lecture uh, in, you should, you should come up with the book. Um, well, Stephen Howe has very helpfully um, pasted a link into the chat as you speak. So, it is, um, it, uh, so there it is for those who wish to explore it. And I have to say that um, if the talk has achieved one thing, it is a desire to go off and pour over those illustrations uh, for, um, for longer than was possible, of course, within this talk. So um, one of the great miseries of uh, the world in which we are now living is, uh, and it's particularly keenly felt, I think, by any of us who teach or give talks, is that sense of community and that sense of um, uh, involved in giving a talk is not there. The conversations that happen naturally after a talk are so difficult to have. And for those of us in an audience, I think what is miserable is that we can't show our appreciation uh, for such a talk with the volume, at least, uh, that we would like to do. So, um, but Ellis, thank you so much for just a fascinating, um, a fascinating talk and for yes, opening the pages for us on this treasure. Um, and uh, can I just say once again how thrilled I am that you were able to join us and that the hundreds of you still with us were also able to join us. So there are some virtues in this world in that many more of you were able to come and join us for this talk than would have been possible in our 
rather small lecture theatre. So thank you all, and I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your evening, if it is indeed evening where you are joining us from. Thank you.